Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Carl, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, reverse engineering, uh, some standard techniques, and uh, what happens when those fails, and some tricks you can try instead. Uh, and I'm going to do this in the context of uh, some uh, competitive challenges that I've encountered and solved. Uh, but before um, we dive in, I'm just going to do a quick presentation of myself. Uh, my name is Carl. I'm 26 years old, and I've studied engineering physics and computer science at KTH in Stockholm. Uh, since about a month back, I work as the head of security at CRU. Uh, we're creating a modern healthcare. And uh, I also uh, compete in uh, hacking competitions with uh, our team, uh, Hacking for Soju. And this is uh, going to be relevant for um, some parts of this talk. And uh, yeah, you can reach me uh, by these means or uh, whatever social media you uh, prefer. So anyway, um, let's dive into it. Uh, um, first, I just want to talk a little bit about reverse engineering uh, in general as a concept. So the purpose of uh, reverse engineering um, is usually to, to take something apart, it might be software, hardware, anything, uh, to understand how it works. Uh, and while doing this, you can have uh, several different uh, specific goals in mind. Uh, for example, if you're reverse engineering a malware, uh, say a ransomware, uh, you might wonder uh, how the encryption works, uh, can we break it, uh, or something like that. Or maybe you're uh, auditing some uh, third-party closed-sourced component and you want to know uh, if it is secure or uh, how it handles a specific case or, uh, and so on. And very, very roughly, you can divide the, te the techniques you use in reverse engineering into two broad categories, uh, static analysis and dynamic analysis. So static analysis is very roughly speaking, basically when you, like, you take the thing and you look at it and you try to figure out what it is. So for example, in, in software, you look at the code and you try to uh, decide what the co code would do if you were to run it. And uh, um, a positive thing about this is that in some sense, like, you have all the information. It's all there. You just have to read it and, and interpret it. Uh, in practice, though, uh, it might be like an overwhelmingly huge task and uh, too big to complete in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, dynamic analysis, on the, hand, on the other hand, is, is very nice because uh, you, can, you can run the code um, and just see what it does uh, in some, some parts. So you just maybe look at like, the input and output of some kind of uh, function and you really realize what it is and you can move on. The downside is that uh, the program might not behave uh, in the way you want, it might not reach the state you are interested in, and so on, so you might not get in the full picture. Um, so, I'm going to talk about uh, these reverse engineering challenges uh, I've solved, two of them, and uh, kind of the motivation for, for doing this is uh, to, to uh, push yourself and, and um, find these strange challenges to uh, uh, improve yourself in, in reverse engineering so that when something uh, really comes along, uh, you are prepared. So um, this thing uh, came along, uh, the Mobfuscator. So I don't know if you know about it, but um, someone wrote a, a paper uh, where they explained that the x86 move instruction is uh, Turing complete, which means that with this instruction, uh, you can create basically any program. So this guy, Chris Thomas, he took this maybe a little bit too far and created a compiler which takes C code and compiles it into a program consisting of only x86 move instructions. Um, so uh, the top image, I think it's kind of hard to see, but that's like the output of uh, a function which checks uh, if uh, a number is a prime number. Uh, the, the main thing here that it, is that it's reasonably short. Uh, the image at the bottom is definitely not readable, but what it is is the same code ran through the Mobfuscator. So it's just a long series of move instructions, and this does uh, the same thing. So the problem when uh, reverse engineering something like this is that 
you have no branches in the code. There are no functions. It's just one sequential uh, flow, uh, which makes it very, very hard to, to understand what's going on. So the way this works is that sometimes the instructions operate on real data and sometimes on dummy data. Uh, a little bit like uh, in ARM, you have these uh, conditional instructions which only actually execute if uh, a certain flag is uh, set. Uh, so the, the setup, this competitive setup, was a, a classic thing called a, a crack me, which is basically a program that takes an input and then says if it's the right input or not. And by looking at the validation function, you're supposed to figure out what the correct input is. Um, so I started out with like how I would look at the reverse engineering challenge. So like, are there any function? Can I, can I look and maybe give them sensible names to like abstract away those and study the branches? But as I said earlier, there are no functions, there are no branches. So these like static analysis methods uh, didn't work at all. Um, what I would then move on to uh, is to do um, an execution trace you could, you could use this to, like, you, re, you run the program and you record the instructions executed to see if maybe if you change the input, maybe the, the uh, execution trace changes and maybe you can gain some insights from that. Um, the problem is here that, like I said earlier, we have no branches, no nothing, so it's always the same instructions uh, executed. So the execution trace would always look the same. Uh, and an even simpler method that also can give very uh, good insights is just execution or uh, instruction counting. So you run the program, you count how many instructions were executed, and you try to deduce something from that when changing the input. Uh, the same problem here. It's just the same amount of, the exact same set of instructions are executed every time. So at this point, I had to like step back, take, take some kind of break, and, and think like, okay, so what am I actually looking at? So in some sense, uh, what would I expect to differ? Uh, and this, this kind of like uh, got me thinking about a little bit like what is uh, a program? So most interesting programs, uh, they take some kind of input, they perform some kind of calculation, and then they affect the world somehow. It might be some kind of output, uh, reading, writing to memory, uh, and so on. So at some point, uh, if this program is going to be interesting, at some point it has to do something differently uh, than another run. Otherwise, this program would always do exactly the same thing and that would not be interesting. So, if the instructions don't change, which we know they don't, then the memory has to change at some point. So, I realized then, but by just doing a memory trace instead, so we could uh, record all the memory addresses that were read from and written to, and we could then um, like compare these uh, different recordings and see which one differed the most. So I started out by doing like a one character input uh, for every uh, different character uh, and did these memory recordings, see which one differed the most, and there was one like really sticking out. Uh, so the uh, guess was that this was the first correct character. And then by just putting this in a nice, uh, ugly scripting uh, loop, uh, eventually the uh, password uh, would appear. So that's uh, some dynamic analysis used to solve a software problem. Another, another uh, challenge I solved uh, was a hardware challenge, uh, or simulated hardware at least. So uh, in, in electronics, you have uh, these uh, Boolean uh, circuits. So you have signals, and they are like one or zero, true or false, high or low. Uh, same thing, different names. Uh, and you have these gates. So it can be simple uh, Boolean gates, like an OR function, an AND function, XOR, and so on. And then you can combine these together into more complicated gates. Um, so this uh, bottom image is if you combine um, four different gates in this feedback manner, you get uh, a D-latch, which is kind of like a one-bit uh, memory cell. And an interesting thing here is that some of these gates, for example, the NAND gate, uh, it uh, is what you, you call uh, functionally complete, uh, which is uh, kind of like a, a Turing complete. So basically, any uh, Boolean circuit that you can create, you can create from only using uh, a whole bunch of NAND gates. Um, so in this uh, setting, uh, we were given um, 
a, a schematic of a, of a circuit. So to the right is a keypad, like a regular uh, digit uh, keypad. Uh, to the left is an, uh, is an integrated circuit, and one of the pins is then connected uh, to a lock. So the goal is to find out what key combination opens the lock. So for the integrated circuit, we were also given a list of 248 NAND gates. So basically someone had taken like the original uh, sensible um, circuit and did kind of like the same thing as with the uh, Movisgator. It had been like compiled down to only using NAND gates. So there were 248 NAND gates and how they were connected to each other. Um, so the uh, intended way to solve this was to like simulate this and brute force different key combinations and stuff. Uh, but uh, that's uh, not as fun. Also, uh, I didn't manage to do that when I tried it. So I went down uh, this other uh, rabbit hole. Uh, so the I, general idea was to, um, kind of in the same sense that, so, like when you reverse engineer uh, software, to find um, patterns, to find uh, repetitions in this uh, huge graph. Uh, so I started by just um, plotting up the whole circuit graph. And this looks really horrible. And this is just like one third of the image or something. Uh, and uh, at least this tells me absolutely nothing. Uh, the only thing I did here was to replace. So if you have a NAND gate with the same inputs to both of the inputs, that's just a NOT gate. So I uh, replaced those with the blue nodes. So you have the red NAND gates and the blue NOT gates. Uh, this didn't tell me anything at all. But I started looking for some repetitions. So, for example, if you have a NAND gate directly followed by a NOT gate, that's an AND gate, and so on. So I started grouping these together. And uh, you can see that this reveals some kind of structure in the circuit. But it was, it was still uh, too uh, verbose to like, be able to work with this in a, in a nice and smooth way. So what I did was then to start collapsing these uh, groups, replacing multiple uh, nodes with a single node. Uh, kind of like the same way you would do in software, if you find uh, some function that does something, uh, you would just think, like, okay, this function performs maybe, I don't know, a base 64 uh, conversion or something, and you would just leave it at that and don't go into the details on how that's uh, accomplished. So by doing this, uh, in a sense, this was like two steps forward, one step backward. Uh, again, we kind of lost some kind of structure, but I had a lot of different types of, of uh, nodes. So uh, now I have these um, light blue uh, AND gates and these uh, yellow uh, one-bit uh, memory cells. And then I started grouping these together to like find some kind of structure, and eventually ended up with something like this. And it's a little bit difficult to see, but um, in the top right, you have a group, uh, which is a four-bit counter. So I realized that this was uh, the state machine of the digit, uh, the, the key lock. So when you press a digit uh, on a keypad, basically if you press the correct next digit, you advance the state machine by one, and if you press an incorrect digit, you will return it to the initial state. Uh, so this counter kept track of uh, how far along you have come in entering the uh, combination. And then uh, in the top left, there are uh, three uh, regions uh, with uh, one of them containing uh, a counter as well, uh, which is a scan line uh, counter. So basically the way a keypad works is that you have um, outputs going into each row of the keypad, and then you have inputs going out from each column. So you will, um, in a quick succession, uh, you will put the output at one row at a time uh, to high, and then we'll check, you will check for input in the column. So for example, if uh, row number two is active and you get an input on column number three, that means uh, someone is pressing the uh, digit six, because that will connect uh, row two uh, with column three. So this is just looping over and over again to uh, find which uh, digit is being pressed. Um, and then the actually interesting part comes, because by just moving these things to the side and like abstracting them away, 
uh, we would have these two rows in the middle, the light blue row and the red row in the very middle of the image, uh, which were nodes uh, that took like one input from the keypad and one input from the state machine. So by just naming them uh, according to uh, what state they represented. So this node will be active, for example, when the state machine is in state eight and key five is pressed. So basically by just naming them in this way, you could basically read the combination straight off the names of these nodes uh, in the middle. And uh, that way this uh, challenge was solved. So uh, again, why, why am I telling you this? Uh, because, I mean, you probably won't encounter these two examples uh, in your day-to-day -day work. But the idea is that uh, if you uh, practice on these like, difficult and strange challenges, you will work up this expertise in, in reverse engineering so that like, when you encounter these things, uh, it's easy and you don't get frustrated or make uh, mistakes that cost you time and so. So it's, it's kind of like uh, going to the gym. Like a professional football player would maybe go to the gym, uh, work in the rowing machine, but he or she wouldn't go out on the football field, sit down and start rowing. That's not what they do. Um, so I'm just encouraging you to do these kind of challenges, uh, push your limits and have fun. And if you are interested in reverse engineering, uh, there is a competition starting next weekend called Labyrinth. They're doing this for the second year. It's organized by Palo Alto Networks. Uh, so it's a reverse engineering challenge that will run for, what's that, like five or six weeks, seven maybe. Um, and it was really, really fun and educational last year. So there's a lot of different tracks with reverse engineering challenges in Windows, Unix, mobile, so on. And there's a lot of prize money as well. So I really encourage you to check that out. And uh, with that, um, thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any questions? Is that totally clear to everyone? Awesome. Cool. I hope to see all of you guys win all that prize money in Labyrinth then. Uh, all right. Thank you once again, Kevin. Thank you.